I'm looking forward to Lisa's lecture and her thoughts on oceans, boats, and making waves. Please join me in welcoming our 2016-2017 Fall Invited Faculty Lecturer, Lisa Smith. <laughs> Thank you. No. Mm. Thank you. Got me up. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for um, following 270 who are following direct orders to be here, which I respect and understand. Thank you for that. I will try to make it more interesting than what might show up on your cell phone for the next 45 minutes or so. For those of you who are education majors, uh, <laughs> dang it, <laughs> this one's for you. <laughs> Okay, so I, I know, two minutes in and I get choked up. This is uh, a conversation about the work that I find most meaningful in the world. And one of, the, one of my freshman students this semester has already asked, did you always want to be a teacher? And my answer was, oh no, no. As a matter of fact, I resisted it pretty heavily. Um, that is a combination of experiences that I have been through that brought me back into teaching and have made it my life's work. And the interesting thing about that, about life's experiences, and the fact that I focus all of my attention on the pursuit of knowledge, is that one of the things I believe to be true about that is that knowledge is constructed. It's a social construct. What we learn comes from the influences, the environment, the way we identify in our world. And in high school, interestingly enough, when I think about um, that in my own life, how knowledge is constructed, how it's a social experience, I think about one of my uh, most respected teachers. And, and if you think about knowledge as constructed from the people and the environment around you, then everybody around you becomes a teacher, right? So in high school, Jerry Jorgensen was one of my teachers, and we were seated, not surprisingly, in a circle, for those of you who know me, and uh, we were debating religious topics. And uh, at that time in my life, I tended to try to push back at every opportunity. Push, 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 push. Never really agreeing, always trying to go beyond what was in front of me. And at that moment, Jerry looked at me and with a smile on his face and a tone of pleasure, he said, you are such a rebel. And for the first time, and I remember this so clearly, this rush of relief came over me. It was like, well, everybody else kind of thinks I'm a naughty adolescent, that I don't make the greatest choices, and I'm kind of mouthy, and I smart off. But the way you just said that makes it seem like I have permission, that that's a good thing. And that influenced my identity. It changed the way I thought about myself and how I showed up in the world. Not long after, I find my, found myself at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln as a first-year college student, absolutely lost and clueless. Classes held in rooms bigger than this with more people than I'd been around in my graduating class in Little Blair, Nebraska. And the noise of it all was so loud, I couldn't even hear my own voice. About three semesters in, well, exactly three semesters in, with a bright and shiny, maybe it was at a 2.0 grade point average, not something I recommend, just let me make that clear, Dr. Fromgen, um, but about to receive my first notice of academic probation, I knew I wasn't in the right place at the right time, and I gathered my rebel courage and I ran away to Northern California. Um, it was running away because we didn't have cell phones, which meant my parents couldn't track me running away. And, um, lived there and worked there and made a life there and asked questions of myself there and could finally hear who I was. And one of the jobs that I had, I had several jobs, of course, to make way, 
yeah, yeah, lots of jobs. And uh, the last one before I came, returned to Nebraska was uh, I had the privilege of working for the U.S. Forest Service as a, uh, as a uh, surveyor. Uh, as part of the first all-female survey crew for the National Forest Service, not by choice, but by force. They needed quota. And um, so we were the four women assigned to up the quota there in the Plumas. And one of the things we did was work really hard because we wanted to prove ourselves. And we worked so hard that that season and it was a huge fire season. It was really hot. And um, fires were burning from uh, Yosemite to Yellowstone, and so resources were thin. And so we were trained not just to be surveyors, but also to be sawyers, chainsaw operators, so that we could um, not only feel really cool about ourselves, uh, but we could also, while we were out in the forest, out in the mountain, we could address fires should they start up, which we figured would never really actually happen. It was back to that quota thing. So imagine our surprise when one wet day we drive around the curve and there's a fire. It was a lightning strike. It had hit the tree, moved down through into the root system, into the duff layer of the forest um, land, ground, and was burning not only underground, but the flames were starting to lick up into the, to the underbrush. And we're like, crap, we really have to put this fire out or we got to do something about it. So we start working on this fire and we radio in our location and a work crew is coming and we're like, okay, we aren't really going to have to see this all the way through. But in the moments or hours or whatever it was that we stood there, for the first time in my life, I thought, this work that I am doing really matters. If we don't do this, if we walk away from this work, the whole forest is going down in flames, and it'll be because of us. So we're digging, and we're working, and we contained it, and you'll be happy to know that real firefighters showed up and took care of the issue. But shortly after I returned home thinking, I really want to do work in the world that matters. I want my work to matter. I knew I didn't want to be a firefighter, so I went back into exploring the idea of being an educator. For the next decades, I would study learning. I would study knowledge. I would study teaching. But one of the most important learnings that I had at that time is something that I want to share with you, and that is, what is this thing called schooling that is the common denominator between everyone in this room? So I want to share some historical narrative and hope that my computer did not completely go to sleep and log off. Oh, I'm there. Is it there? Okay. This is where... We're not good. I got this. All right. Oh, technology. OK, so the story actually starts with boats. As I promised, there's boats. Our forefathers, European forefathers, the forefathers of this country, Right, came over on boats. They came across the ocean in pursuit of land and liberty. Those people knew that knowledge had power, that knowledge was power. And in the first two centuries, predominantly, schooling was about assimilation. Schooling was about making sure that everybody was on the same page. And in the, from the 1600s on, the first people who had that privilege, who had access to that privilege, were people from European, who descended from European, European heritage, predominantly male. I'm just saying the facts. I'm not saying that was good or bad. I'm just saying that's the way it was. When they went to school, these students learned how to be citizens who could communicate, calculate, and whose civic and social behaviors were grounded in theology. To be educated was to access power, and the system did exactly what it was intended to do. Slaves were a part of the culture and climate of that time, and they were forbidden from receiving an education. Why? 
because knowledge has power, right? <laughs> Education for women was minimized so that they would play a supporting role to the men who were building a nation. Education was doing exactly what it was intended. There came a point that there was a little problem with the Native American people who were on the land and who actually discovered it. And it would be embarrassing to kill them all off. So instead, schooling for Native American children meant rounding them up, taking them from their culture, their family, their language, everything that they knew, and putting them in boarding schools where they were indoctrinated into the Euro-American um, system of education. Education has power. It was doing exactly what it was intended to do. So after uh, a period of time during the Reconstruction era, when the black community was no longer forbidden from accessing education, they had to do so under their own power and with their own efforts and resources, separate and pretend to be equal. Educational rights were the cornerstone of the civil rights movement, and in the 1950s, Brown versus Board of Education opened the gate to desegregation with a sound wave that has lasted to today, especially in the southern part of the United States. Only in the last 50 years, okay? I'm 50, so most. I will be this year. In my lifetime, we began to address as a society the idea that children who come with poverty have a right to an equal education. Special education became a thing since 1973 to 1975. Women, through Title IX, were allowed access and told that they should not be discriminated against with regard to educational programming. It's in your syllabus. <laughs> we make sure it is. But that's an interesting thing, isn't it? We still have to talk about it today because we're just babies at this. This is brand new to us, this actually allowing everyone to access an education. So back to around the time I was born, it was finally time for everyone to come to school and be there in their seats, quietly, ready to have information deposited into their empty little heads. Raise your hand if you have a question, right? Anybody recognize that? We received the information that was allowed to us. Information that was in the hands of the people who were making the decisions about what we should know and what we shouldn't know. Schooling became and remained industrialized, whitewashed, and tightly controlled through curriculum that carried the story of those who won the battles through glorious justification. And nowhere is that more clear than in what I call the first contact fairy tales that serve up a story of European exploration and settlement of the Americas that involved long picnic tables where European pilgrims and native people sat together and celebrated their co-collaborative efforts over roast turkey, mashed potatoes, gravy, some stuffing, and a slice of pumpkin pie. When in fact, the behaviors of first contact included pretend to be nice, land grab, enslave, mass rape and torture, served with a side of genocide. And these are the stories that are not pretty to tell. And so we don't. We don't. From the first formal schools of the early 1600s to the 21st century systems, we have done exactly what we intended to do. And the reason that that could happen is because one body has the power over the information and the way that it is disseminated. But that has changed. That 
is no longer true. So in just minutes, you have access to more information than I had my entire lifetime of schooling. That remains true on a daily basis. When I look at the headlines today, I know that social media and other avenues of disseminating information have offered us an incredible opportunity. We can hold conversations about what's happening in learning, in education, in our world, and we don't have to have permission from anybody. So when you see headlines like this, I just cut these right out of uh, things that were showing up on my Facebook feed over the course of the last week. Just took minutes to find these things. Textbook in Texas that is currently being used where Mexicans are identified as being lazy. Remember what I said about knowledge being constructed and our identities being so, so important? Today we can call that out. Today we can say that's not working for an entire population. Today we have access to information that informs our response to the events that are happening all around us. So I probably don't need to tell any of you why these kinds of articles popping up are really important. They inform us about pieces of information that were once found only in books, had to find where the book was, had to have access to the book. Today we have access to information like never before. It informs how we show up in making knowledge. We're talking about things that we have never really talked about before. Mispronouncing student names is something that maybe we giggle about and we say, ah, that was funny, I'm really trying. <laughs> yeah, it does damage that is systemic and long term. And having that information in front of us allows us to engage in a deeper conversation. Can't leave out the science though. Can't leave out the economy though. We may not want to admit it yet, but we have some work to do. We're kind of leaving a mess for you, and you're going to need to clean it up. When we've left things out, when we've negated entire populations in our historical narrative, with the click of a button, we can come back to that and have access and redefine ourselves, knowledge, is a social construct. Again, these conversations are difficult. They're hard. We don't want to necessarily step into them, but we can. We can. This is a advertising for a webinar to talk to students about the ideas behind Black Lives Matter. Not to necessarily have an opinion about it, but to talk about it, to understand it, to develop knowledge. I don't know if you can see the image here that's included with this headline. It's a pile, ginormous piles that would fill this room of discarded clothing items generated by fast fashion. I'm a victim of it. I, I play that game as much as anybody does. Here's a little debacle. Oops, <clears throat> if you really can see this, for those of you that can't, on the left is a Girl's Life, September issue, Girl's Life magazine, where the front cover is full of enticing articles like, fall fashion you'll love, your dream hair, the new denim checklist, best year ever. And that's because you're gonna wake up pretty girl's life. And on the right is a sample of Boy's Life magazine that tells them to go on, get out there, explore your future, right? The register even goes down when you read it. <laughs> there are badges and computers and flying things and oh, space shuttles and all kinds of cool crap. Knowledge is a social construct. What are we doing? It is 2016. What are we doing? 
The good news is, the good news is, that you were born of a different time. You are not just the maligned millennials, or whatever it is. Millennials, is that what we call you? <laughs> Labels, again. <laughs> you were born in a time where all the people around you came from the stuff I was telling you about. So you're one foot in. We teachers, that's our world. That's where we came from. What we know and do and understand, it's from that place. But you have your foot in a new place. A place where information is available in unbelievable amounts. So it is like in this photo where I am standing on the shore of an ocean, Atlantic, I believe, and all around me in the shallow pool, that's what I have contact with. But out beyond me is this incredible ocean, and that is like you. You are standing at the edge of an incredible amount of information. And where you stand, or kneel, where you stand matters. And the way that it matters is because of a little idea called positionality. And that is that where you stand in relation to others in society shapes what you can see and understand about the world. Right here. What you can see shapes how you see the world. It means that you are in your own experience and you know that well, but you do not know the experience of someone standing down the way. You don't know what the possibility is out in that ocean of information. David Foster Wallace, we know David Foster Wallace, about 270 of you do. First year reader, here's your connection, all right? In a commencement address titled, This is Water, he identifies the idea that learning how to think, which is what you're supposed to be doing here at college, uh, means being conscious and aware enough to choose what you pay attention to. Conscious and aware of what you choose to pay attention to and then choose how to construct meaning from it. You get to do that. You get to do that. So here at Hastings College, what I propose is that you are no longer in pursuit of the information that gets you an A. That is not your objective. It is not about filling in true and false bubbles but rather about having a transformative academic experience. Transformative academic knowledge is when you blow stuff up. I restrained myself, just saying. <laughs> blow stuff up. Because people, it is not enough to stand on the shore and have your feet in the water of all that information and swim around in it a little bit and paddle around and scroll through your cell phone and bag yourself a few Pokemon. It is not enough to just do that. You have the greatest gift of information ever seen in any of our lifetimes. What you have to learn to do is know when it's true and authentic and real and accurate and when it informs your learning, informs your process. You have to discern. We weren't necessarily taught to do that. You need to do that. What's worth it? What's valuable? But here's the deal. The other part of having access to that information is that in addition, you have access to the entire world in a way, again, that has never been seen before. So what I would encourage is that you develop a global identity. 
a global identity, and put yourself in situations with people who are most not like you. Not like you, not like you, not like you. Why? Because if you surround yourself with the thing that you are familiar with, you are not expanding your possibility, your circle of knowledge, your influence to your intellect. Being in relationship with others is the greatest opportunity you have in combination with the wealth of information you have available to you. You need to find your people. Yes, but you need to find other people too. You need to find historians and sociologists and economists, economic people. Can't say it, switch the word. <laughs> Lesson. You need to find people who know a lot of things about literature. You need to find business owners and community members and mentors because this is the way knowledge expands. Not just scrolling through social media, though, I have to admit, I'm a smarter person because of it. You need to be seated, preferably in a circle, with the people who you find. Because if you keep tootling along in your calm waters, in your little boats, all by yourself, it looks like this, and you'll arrive probably with an A, to your destination, and that will be all fine and dandy. But if you need someone to call you a rebel, if you need permission to cut it loose a little bit, if you need permission to come together and do things differently than they have ever been done before, then let this be it. Let this be permission to get out of the safe boat with your paddles fully intact. Don't just cruise along and hope that the assignment is easy because life won't be. So if you need permission, here it is. Make waves. Make waves. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the place that feels like 375 years that have come before it. Blow some stuff up. Not literally, figuratively. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Johnson. Make things happen. That's it. <laughs> Education people. <laughs> I can. Thank you. Thank you. So there's the beauty of taking 16 slides out all, at about 6 o'clock this morning as it uh, cuts out some of the excess rhetoric, which leaves us time for questions, if there are any. Dr. Logan. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The question is, what would I recommend in a K-12 setting to move away from the structure of schooling where we fill empty heads, that model? And actually, um, I would say that my work, the, the, the work that I currently do is focused on that relationship piece, how we construct knowledge together. And so the work that I do do with administrators in K-12 systems is to help them understand that before
before we are able to absorb all this information, before we're able to use super fancy technology and smart boards and all of that stuff, that's all great, but we need to cultivate a culture where that can actually grow. And so the thing that I am in practice of and the thing that I work with through um, working with students in the education department is the very first place we start is within that classroom and how do we create a culture where we release our power and our sense of authority over information and we create an environment where students have power and authority and access to information. Kind of the thing I said just for you to go do. Like, Take power, have power, be empowered. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Oman. Uh huh. So I find that I'm trying to get away from that traditional model, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that space is really awkward, right? That space where we have one foot planted in a system of education where we have been, you have been, well trained to sit still and listen, and you have not been given permission to, to cut loose a little bit, to engage with one another. You don't even know one another, right? You're not willing to step out and take that risk. You're going to look stupid. You're going to make mistakes. And that feels icky, right? We don't want to feel stupid. We like to feel smart. So I think what's happening is, is our own um, adversity to risk is choking us, possibly to death, right? Because if we don't get over that, then we sit in awkward silence with each other. And maybe that's the place to start. To, to identify that it's safe, that stupid is a social construct too. And we can ditch it out the door. Forming agreements, saying this is awkward, I want you to take a risk. I think those are important things for us to do too as professors. Um, but it's something you have to work on, not wanting to feel stupid. Yeah, does that respond? Be daredevils. Be warned, Dr. Oman's gonna like, if you have her for class. Bailey. How would you start incorporating circle into an elementary classroom? I'm in third grade right now. Mm-hmm. Right. So circle, what she's referencing, Bailey asked, how would you incorporate circle with young children? And actually young children have not been completely washed out yet. They are still willing to take risks. And as a matter of fact, it's a matter of containing and controlling a little bit so they don't go over the deep edge. Um, so for third graders, it's, a, it's the simple um, opening circles which, whose purpose is, remember that the purpose of an opening circle, which is a practice we use in the education classroom, in, in my classrooms, is to check in with every learner and put everyone's voice in the room. We can go all day to class and never say a word, can't we? Yes? Have you done it? All day to class and never say a word. We have to break that pattern. Just like it's the same as Dr. Oman's question, your question is exactly the same, it's just different people. Make it safe to put your voice in the room. Yes, ma'am, at the get-go. I taught preschool and kindergarten. Those are the first places I held circle. They were the most enthusiastic and exuberant circles I've probably ever held. <laughs> pick me, pick me. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mine as well. September 16th, it is due. But in this rubric, we're going to set up boxes of expectations. 
Education is also very hierarchical. <laughs> Hmm. It actually runs along with it, okay? So rubrics are a way to identify what the expectations are for the A, right? So one foot in this world. But a rubric also allows us to go off the grid. We don't just have to do what's in the rubric, right? Step into the other place. So it allow, it's a bridge. A rubric of expectation says, okay, where is he living? All right, we got that. Now what are we going to do with it? So it says you have to have multiple sources, if I remember correctly, this INT first paper project. And it gives you a list of possible sources. Those aren't the only sources you have to use. Check my stuff. Don't take my word for it, right? I'm just one voice in this. Don't take David Foster Wallace as is. Dig a little deeper, right? It's about being a servant leader. It says you have to put a little bit of your own story in there. What do you think and feel about that? Expectations from this side are clear. What you do with them is up to you. It's both and. It's okay. I handed out the rubric too. It's right there. <laughs> Greer, you already have an A this morning. <laughs> Look at that. See how easy it is? You show up with the right materials, you get an A. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. How would you go about empowering students who have just been molded into thinking mm. one direction? How would you help them empower themselves in the real world, outside of college? The outside question college? is, how do... How would a teacher empower students who have been squeezed into the 360 or 375 year model of teaching and learning? And what do you want them to be like? Um, just to like help them take that further into their own worlds. Right, take that further into their own worlds. Actually, my first suggestion would probably be to get out of your own world, right? So remember what I said is 375 years we've been standing right here. This is our access zone. Certain people have said what I can learn within it. My recommendation would be step out of it. Make your circle bigger, go deeper. Find people who are less like you is what I would recommend to those students. Get out of your own box. Yeah. One more. Dr. Fromgen. You grown-ups have monopolized this conversation, I'm just telling you. Can you give them examples of how, how you've done this in your own life? <laughs> That's a great one. How I have done, oh, getting out of my own box. Well, in my family, traveling is a thing. It's a good thing to travel. Woohoo! My sister's here. Um, you should always bring your sister to a big speech that you have to do. She'll tell you you're great afterwards, even if you stunk, right? That's your job. Yeah, that's it, right. Um, <clears throat> so my family has always been travelers. And um, I have a deep and committed urge to travel. So I don't shop at Walmart or Target, and I don't decorate my house fancy, and I don't spend money on things that maybe other people might spend it on. Instead, I save it up, beg, borrow, and steal, put it on a credit card. Oh, that's a bad thing to say. But um, if, if the thing is happening, I want to go and be there. So for example, uh, three years ago, I wanted to go overseas, and I wanted to explore this concept of circle that I've been working with, with people in Europe who have been experiencing the same work. And so I said to the universe, I am going to the Netherlands. And before you know it, I'm on a plane, because my whole life started moving in that direction, right? The funding came, the time came, the support came, and I found myself 
on a path headed to the Netherlands. While I was there, I said, this is so fantastic, and I love these people that I've met. I'm coming back again. And I said that to them, and they said, fantastic. We want to host you. You need to come back. We want to continue this conversation. So I said to the universe again, universe, I'd like to go back, and let's add Belgium to the travel package. <laughs> and by golly, Netherlands and Belgium, and I got to take my family with me that time as well. In between, spring break was coming up, and I'm like, where do I want to go in the world? What people do I want to know better than I know right now? And my sister said, I'll go with, how about Belize? So off to Central America, Central America, we went, a place I had never been before, on a very cheap budget, also take your sister along because she pays half, and um, makes it manageable, but at all costs. So when I was in my first year of college, part of that 2.0 grade point average is because sometimes to get away from the noise I would get in my car and I would go with a tent in the back and go camp in Colorado for a week. My parents didn't know. Don't tell. <laughs> but... So travel was my way to take risks. Travel was my way to step out into the world and get out of my own zone. Is that inspiring? You over here, you're making plans. <laughs> So if I miss class, it's because you're where? Camping or something. Sweet. It's a deal. <laughs> Take pictures. Prove you were there. We're good. Good? All right. I think that's it. You need to go to class.